royal mess. So he's talking about the Greek Septuagint. Now, what is this? Well, in the days of Jerome and Augustine, late 4th century AD, there was a Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. Okay, And Augustine believed that this Greek translation of the Old Testament that was available to him in the 4th century called the Septuagint, that that is the, the Word of God, it's inspired translation. That's the Old Testament that we ought to be using, and we don't need the Hebrew at all. We need to just forget about the Hebrew Bible and just make this Septuagint our final authority. Okay. Now, Augustine, of course, never said anything like that, uh, but Augustine could not read Hebrew. And the Bible of the early church, there is no question about this, the Bible of the early church was the Greek Septuagint. There is no, there is, again, Anderson has already said, well, we don't say that kind of stuff. Well, he says he claims to. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. He even says he's reading the Greek Septuagint. And again, I'm, I'm highly skeptical. But bit as it may, if he is, then he has no excuse for the, the ignorance that he's demonstrating here. You look at not only apostolic citational usage in the New Testament, but you look at the early fathers, and you ask yourself a question. What scriptural platform are they utilizing? And when it is at all identifiable, it is almost uniformly the Greek Septuagint. I mean, that reflects the reality of Alexander's having spread Koine Greek all around the world. It was still the lingua franca. And so if you wanted to communicate over long distances, there was one way to do so in writing and hope that the person at the other end would know what you were saying. And that was in Koine Greek. And so the translation of the scriptures, which at the time of the apostles did not include the New Testament, obviously, because it hadn't been written yet uh, or is in the process of being written during the apostolic period. Um, that's not around yet. So we're talking about the Greek Subject. Secondly, there is absolutely no question amongst any serious scholar, any serious scholar, that the Greek Septuagint predates the New Testament. This includes all of the King James translators. Read the introduction to the readers by the translators. They don't call it the Septuagint when they're talking about, specifically talk about the Greek version. Um, the 70. They even make reference to the 70, as I recall. Um, I looked it up just last night, was reading what they had to say about it. And though they criticize it for having errors, very plainly, they did not view it in the way that Stephen Anderson does. Stephen Anderson calls it a corrupt 4th century manuscript. That's not what it was. Um, but it plainly is the source of the majority of New Testament citations from the Old Testament. That's the reality. That's the fact. You can't get away from it. It's just how it is. And there you go. On the other side of this argument is Jerome, who believed that we should go back to the original language. He says, well, no, you know, we, we need to actually go back to the original Hebrew. And, you know, if we're going to translate into Latin, we need to translate from... And by the way, Jerome likewise did not hold Anderson's view on this, on this topic either. The Hebrew, because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, it was not written in Greek. So we need to go back to the original Hebrew text and translate that into Latin and cut out this middleman of the Septuagint. Now, not only that, the so-called Septuagint, this 4th century... Uh, Greek Bible that they had there is something that is so corrupt. I mean, it is it is filled with so much error. It's hard to believe that anybody takes it seriously. Okay, um, including evidently the King James translators who did take it seriously. I've got a copy of it right here, the Septuagint with Apocrypha, and I haven't read the whole thing. I'm working on reading it, um, and let me tell you something. It has a lot of problems. First of all. This so-called Septuagint, you know, it, it, it tampers with the numbers in the genealogy leading up to the flood in the days of Noah. And the numbers are so ridiculous that it literally has people, like, outliving the flood. So people are, like, living beyond the flood, but they weren't on the ark with Noah. 
but I guess they just treaded water all that time and they just continued to live on. So the numbers don't even add up. They don't even make sense. Okay. Which is why modern Bible versions don't use those numbers because those numbers are ridiculous. And in the Old Testament, there are a number of places where the Hebrew numbers do not add up either. The reason for this? The Hebrews had, did not have a numerical system. They used letters. And the problem is, when you use letters in your alphabet, they end up looking like words. And very frequently, they can end up being transmitted incorrectly over time. There are numerous, many nu number issues in both the Hebrew and the Greek, and there are some places where the Greek seems to have the best possibility of having communicated the number issue rather than the Hebrew, and vice versa. They are two streams of the transmission of the, literally, the most ancient text, a, a body of literature that has been in use for the longest period of time amongst mankind. I mean, there may be, some people might identify some Babylonian things as being older than Moses, but as far as being in continuous usage and reading, things, there's nothing that I know of that can come close to the antiquity of the oldest portions of the Old Testament. And so, the very fact that what we're arguing about is numbers in the handwritten transmission of documents that are certainly amongst the oldest known to mankind says a lot about how good the text actually is. But the point is, once again, as is so often the case with King James only, is they cannot have equal measure. They cannot fairly analyze arguments on two sides of an issue. So in this case, we're going to have one standard for the Greek Septuagint, a completely different standard for, well, which Hebrew text? Because there's more than one. Oh, yes, there's the Masoretic stream, but there are differences within the Masoretic stream. Qumran indicated that. Is it generally unified? There is a clearly identify, uh, identifiable stream. No question about that. That comes from Qumran. But there are other streams, too. That's where the problem lies. It does all kinds of other crazy things. It removes just multitudes of verses from the book of Job. It takes out like half of the David and Goliath story. Like half the chapter is gone, okay? It has all kinds of nonsense and garbage in it. Tons of omissions. It does not match the Hebrew at all. It's completely different, folks. It's not like, oh, this is a translation of the Hebrew, but no. It's dramatically different, okay? Way different. Now, once again, uh, you're not talking to someone who is overly concerned about accuracy and language, and so he exaggerates everything. And again, the early church proved the mission and the nature of the person of Jesus Christ from the text that he says is completely different than Hebrew. Well, it's not. Now, the Septuagint that we have today, and again, there are variations in the transmission of the Septuagint as well, but the Septuagint we have today, very clearly, the Pentateuch was very well translated. Very well translated. It is an excellent translation of the Hebrew, and it was it's plainly, there. he himself will admit, a small number of Greek fragments have even been found at Qumran. That means it was completed before the days of Jesus. There's no question about it. He goes into, well, there's just so little. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Shows no knowledge whatsoever of how ancient documents trans transmit. Zero. The man knows nothing about this, doesn't care anything about this. We know that the Septuagint preexisted the days of Christ. That's not even an argument. Are there better and worse sections of the Septuagint, accuracy-wise? Of course. I've pointed out that there's, there's major differences in Jeremiah, and there's a reason for that. Jeremiah himself gives the reason for that. 
Um, but these are historical realities. They can't. You, they cannot be dismissed by well, It's just completely different. So James White is basically trying to use this as an illustration and saying, well, you know, it's just like these King James only people. It's just that they don't want to change. They're just emotionally connected to the King James, and it's sentimental, and they just have this attitude of just don't change, just stay with it. And so he's yeah. In other words, people adopt a traditional text and will not apply equal standards in the analysis of that text. That happened with the Greek Septuagint. That then happened with the Latin Vulgate. That's the whole point. He just doesn't want to admit it. And to compare them to the Septuagint crowd, you know, the Augustine crowd that says, hey, we need to just stay with the Septuagint. It's an inspired translation. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that is a totally unfair comparison because the Septuagint says something completely different from what the original Hebrew says. Now, most people at the time didn't know that because as James White points out in this chapter, most Christians at that time did not speak Hebrew and had a hard time with getting the resources to learn Hebrew. And so they- Well, that's not what I pointed out. I, I pointed out that there was a sad um, disjunction between the synagogue and the church and a, a horrific attitude that developed between the two um, that led to an unfortunate ignorance of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Old Testament as a whole, especially with Origen's uh, allegorical interpretation, the things that came from that. No clue that their Greek Septuagint Old Testament was so messed up in the fourth century that, um, you know, that they didn't know how bad it was or unreliable. So to compare that to King James onlyism is ridiculous because we've got the King James, but then we've got this right here. We've got a Greek New Testament. And, you know, we got a Hebrew Old Testament. And so all we have to do is just compare these things and look at them. And we can see that the King James matches up with the original language and says the exact same thing. And what happens when it doesn't? What happens, like I said, in Acts 5? What happens when you have translational issues? Which one becomes the standard? I would argue that, f that functionally... I could not possibly see how Stephen Anderson could ever correct a King James reading anywhere, no matter what the underlying language said. And, and, I, and so you can document specific mistranslations where the King James missed it. Now, anybody can defend anything. I mean, look at the Texas Receptus guy and his his lifelong tilting at windmills to defend Revelation 16. I mean, what a life. Anybody can defend anything. But the reality is that the King James translators did not claim infallibility. And they mistranslated some things. They did not understand things. They were not perfect. And so which one takes precedent? The English translation or the underlying Greek or Hebrew? Uh, functionally, I cannot possibly see how Anderson can avoid making the Hebrew or the, the uh, English the final authority. So we've got an English King James that says the same exact thing as a Greek New Testament that I can pull off the shelf and read and look at. And there it is, folks. It says the same thing. OK. Yeah. And if that's the TR, as we said last time, that's because it's based on the King James. <laughs> it's it's the Greek rendering of the King James. So, yeah, it should say the same thing because it came from the King James, which is really not much of an argument, is it? No. Fourth century Septuagint. And you say, well, why do you keep saying fourth century? You know, the Septuagint was translated, you know, B.C., before Christ. Well, here's why. Because there are no copies of the Septuagint from before Christ. And until Qumran, the oldest Hebrew manuscripts we had were for 900 years after Christ. And this means... Absolutely nothing. This is empty air, pure verbiage that's simply meant to promote a perspective that has no scholarly foundation to it whatsoever. Once again, unequal scales, circular reasoning. It's the essence of King James onlyism. The copies of the Septuagint that they're actually using are corrupted manuscripts from the fourth century AD and later. Okay. So just like there are all kinds of corrupted New Testament manuscripts from the fourth century and beyond, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, etc. Okay, so this so-called Septuagint, this fourth century corrupt Greek text that is just ridiculously different from the Hebrew Old Testament. 
They're using it in the NIV. They're using it in the New American Standard. They're using it in the ESV. So, they're using the same translation that the apostles cited from. And that's terrible. Yeah, that, that, that little part won't end up in his presentation. Well, that, you know, the Septuagint is legit because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found, you know, B.C. manuscripts of the Septuagint. Folks, that is not true. Go on Wikipedia and look at the list Wikipedia. of all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can go on there and it lists all the scrolls. I, you know, off the top of my head, I think there are 939 of them, okay, that were found in Qumran in the 20th century. And here's what you'll find. The so-called Septuagint that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls contains fragments from Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's it. Which means that it existed before the days of Jesus. That's all it means. And that's what it means to anybody who takes history seriously, has any knowledge whatsoever of the study of antiquities, uh, ancient manuscripts, anything like that at all. That's what it means. But that's not what it means in the NIFB, I guess. Greek New Testament, obviously a little Aramaic sprinkled in the Old Testament. So anyway, he's trying to use this as like, well, you know, people just don't like to change. You know, they were hung up on that Septuagint. Yeah, but they were wrong. That's the difference. And they were demonstrably wrong because no one would ever try to claim that the Septuagint and the Hebrew Old Testament both say the same thing. They're not even close, okay? No, they are very, very close, actually. And in fact, with a few exceptions, it's, um, it's useful. If you have the uh, Septuagint on your, on your phone, if you're learning Greek, to read along when the Old Testament is being read. Now, the problem is the chapter, like the Psalter, frequently the chapter divisions are... are messed up. And unless your electronic program corrects that for you, sometimes it can be hard to find. But uh, will you find differences? Yes, you will. But will you be able to read along? I've done it a million times. And if he, as he claims, is reading the Septuagint, he would, he would well know that. So Jerome's Latin translation eventually became known as the Vulgate. But he, that's deceptive, though, because here's the thing. What's known as the so-called Vulgate, like, you know, if I were to just buy the Vulgate, okay, this is not exactly what Jerome translated. This No, uh, and he seemed to miss the, again, did he miss the point, or is he just being obscure, or what? I don't know. Um, I told the story, and in fact, he reads the story of Lorenzo Valla, uh, discovering through the comparison with Jerome's commentaries the changes that had taken place in the Vulgate and stuff like that. But he's missing my point. My point in the chapter was that traditional texts will be defended and they will be defended by utilizing different standards than you apply to anything that's come along since then. So um, this happened with the Septuagint and the Vulgate. This happened with the Vulgate when Erasmus challenged its preeminence with his Novum Instrumentum in 1516. Um, and it has happened with King James only advocates who make the King James translation the standard. And when a new translation comes along, then they use different standards to analyze the one than the other. That was my point, and the fact that he has to keep avoiding it sort of makes my point for me. Since he was unwilling to wait for papal approval, he took a big risk and dedicated... Now, check this out. He's, he's reading from my book, and I'm talking about how was it, given that Cardinal Jimenez's Complutentian Polyglot was already published, uh, was already printed, waiting papal approval, why would it matter if Erasmus rushes his to print because he's got to wait for papal approval too, right? A lot of people ask that question. So he's reading from my book. Since he was unwilling to wait for papal approval, he took a big risk and dedicated his work to Pope Leo X, the same man who excommunicated Martin Luther, hoping that the dedication would deflect any reprisals for rushing his work to press. The gamble worked, and Erasmus had the first published Greek text on the market. Not going to say anything about that, Pastor Anderson? The fact that the very first edition of Erasmus, the very first edition of what becomes the TR, was dedicated to the Pope who excommunicated Martin Luther for believing in justification by faith. Not going to say anything about that, because I can guarantee you if the shoe was on the other foot, you'd preach 47 sermons about it. But no, no, doesn't fit the narrative, doesn't fit the narrative. We won't talk about it. <laughs> This is not relevant, okay, because Erasmus's first edition was immediately followed by a second edition fixing the error. Yeah, he was in a hurry. I don't blame him for wanting to get it out the door. 
You know, when everybody's in the dark and when the Catholic Church has their corrupt Bible. Uh, that's not Erasmus's view. That wasn't Erasmus's view. Erasmus wasn't saying that, oh, the Roman Catholic Church. He was a Roman Catholic, Pastor Anderson. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He believed in transubstantiation. You're trying to turn him into a into a Baptist? <laughs> he was not a Baptist, okay? Not there. Ant doesn't work. Wrong. So what? He got something out the door, and he corrected it and purified it and purified it, and they had almost 100 years to purify it by the time the King James came out. So any errors in the first edition of Erasmus are not relevant to the King James Bible because that stuff was all corrected over many, many decades to follow. Sounds like Ruckman's theory that when it's pointed out to him that no one's carrying around a 1611, they've got a 1769 Blaney revision, but then there's the Oxford edition, there's a the Cambridge edition, and, and so Ruckman came up with the idea that the finely purified text was the, what, the Oxford Schofield reference edition or something? That there had been this purification process. So, so now you've got the purification process of Erasmus and then Stephanus and Beza. So you got all these Calvinists that God is using to purify the biblical text because both Stephanus and Beza were Calvinists, Pastor Anderson. What are you laughing about? <laughs> you just described textual purgatory. <laughs> Textual purgatory, purification. It was, it was, pur it was being, being, being purified in purgatory. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's going on. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just a hoot to, to listen to this. Oh, there's this purification process being done by Calvinists that eventually led to, you know. And the problem is, Pastor Anderson, that your TR is not Beza. It takes from all that purified, quote-unquote, purified process. So... Again, the study of history is, um, is an important aspect of knowing the truth. And uh, given that Pastor Anderson admitted, well, we don't really do that very much, explains uh, 